Good afternoon. I hope of all the things you've learned so far, one, one important one is that you understand that viruses are highly flexible, they change, and new ones seem to be arising at a high rate. And today, we're going to talk about the underlying principles. We're going to talk about how viruses evolve. And then next time, on Wednesday, we'll talk about how this leads to the emergence of new infections. Now, many years ago, Darwin wrote in a notebook uh, based on all his studies of different organisms that he could see, you know, like pigeons and finches. He put together his idea of evolution, and he, he scribbled it here in this wonderful tree of life that he drew, where he set forth the idea that all the different forms of a species you see originated from a precursor and underwent selection. And I love that he wrote, I think, and he wrote the tree. He drew out the tree. And uh, a couple of years ago at a virology meeting, I saw at a bar a young lady who turned out to be a virologist with, this, with the thing tattooed on her shoulder. And I did ask her if I could take this picture. Uh, so that's pretty cool. It's the same thing, I think. And I looked at it and I said, is that? And she said, yes, it's Darwin's. So Darwin built his trees using characteristics of animals that he could see. Of course, he didn't know anything about viruses. Today, we don't just look at the, the visible characteristics of organisms. Of course, for viruses, it's hard to do that. We look at the genome sequence, and we make trees which we now call phylogenetic tree. And the whole science of phylogenetics is about uh, placing organisms on a tree, not only accord, according to how we think they evolved, but according to their, their sequences. And we have, I think I have shown you a few trees throughout this course. Let's now really define what they are. So here on the right is an example of a phylogenetic tree for a number of different viruses. What these do is basically measure the genetic difference between organisms. So uh, we, we'd like to say how these different viruses, one through 10, uh, are related. And we, we draw the tree with nodes uh, those are the blue circles here. We can construct these given the nucleotide sequences of genes or entire viral genomes. The node is, is considered to be the ancestor of the two viruses. So virus one and two had an ancestor. Uh, and that ancestor had another ancestor which gave rise to two other viruses which are on different parts of the tree because their sequences are different. And so the idea is that you have a common ancestor which gives rise to uh, two different viruses, and then the, the two viruses evolve independently from that original one. And sometimes we don't have these ancestors. In fact, often we do not have them. They're inferred. And at the left uh, is the common ancestor in red to all of these viruses, which we can infer from the sequence, but which we often uh, do not have. So we construct these trees using differences in nucleotide sequences. Often it's done with a single gene, but many times you compare different genes of viruses, and if you get similar trees, that's good. It gives you confidence that what you're looking at uh, is correct. So we're gonna look at a couple of these trees next time, and in fact, in subsequent lectures. And the idea is, again, that you infer the relatedness between viruses. So virus one and two are highly related here and they form a cluster separate from viruses three and four, et cetera, and we can infer the common ancestors and so forth. So this is the study, this is the science of phylogenetics. And now we can understand evolution in molecular terms, of course, where you know, Darwin didn't even know about a gene when he proposed his theory, but now we know exactly what genes are and we can study how they evolve. And so here is an example, a reimagining of Darwin's hypothesis, if you would like. We have, we're looking at a host protein. We can go down to that level. We have a host protein which is well adapted to its environment, whatever that might be. And the environment somehow changes. And these can be minor changes, but enough so that the protein is now maladapted to its environment. But because of mutations that occur in the genome, leading to a different protein. This protein can undergo adaptive 
evolution so that it is now better adapted to the new environment. Now this, is, this protein would be one among many, say, parental proteins which, were, which was maladapted. And all of those other maladapted proteins are now eliminated by what we call purifying selection. So this new adapted protein is better uh, able to grow under the new conditions. It amplifies at the expense of all the others which are gone. And now we now have a host protein in a new environment. And we can see this at many levels. Uh, all the way down to the single nucleotide change, and we'll explore some of this later. Darwin would have loved viruses. He didn't know anything about them, but I wish we could tell him about it today. He would have been amazed because viruses are the best exemplars of natural selection, of evolution by natural selection. And for RNA viruses, it can happen so quickly that you can see it in real time. You can do an experiment and in a very short period of time, hours, watch natural selection lead to the evolution of new phenotypes. So it's a shame that he didn't get to uh, explore viruses. So viral evolution is the constant change of a population under selection, and we're gonna talk about this in two broad questions today. We're, we're gonna talk about where viruses come from and where are they going. So the tools we will explore will help you better understand these two questions. Modern virology has provided a window on how evolution works, the precise mechanisms. And in fact, I would say personally, I didn't really understand evolution until I studied viruses in detail. It really helps you understand because it's, it's all accelerated and it's all about selection. So uh, the, the concepts are distilled here uh, as host populations, host populations for the viruses change, viruses are selected that can infect them. And in fact, we know new viral populations emerge on a daily basis, but it works the other way as well. Virus population can be very important forces in the evolution of host populations. Viruses can change what kinds of host populations exist. And if the host can't adapt to a lethal infection, the population may be exterminated. Same for the virus. If a virus can't come to some kind of equilibrium uh, with its host, the virus will be gone as well. No doubt throughout history, there have been many examples of hosts and viruses that have gone extinct because this balance couldn't be maintained. It's, it's not a conscious decision that happens. It's a selection issue. When uh, the virus and the host are well balanced by the selective forces, then uh, they both exist. So of course today we can only study the species that are still here and which presumably represent the spectrum of evolution that's gone on in the past. And I like to think that the public is, is constantly confronted with the re reality of viral evolution even if they don't believe in evolution. Right? There are many people out there who do not believe it. I get letters all the time from people who, who uh, do not believe in evolution, yet on a daily basis, you are seeing the product of evolution in the form of new viral diseases, AIDS, West Nile virus, Hep C, Ebola virus, Zika virus. These are new infections that emerge because of evolution. Flu every year, it evolves to be able to circumvent the vaccine, common cold viruses, drug resistance like we talked about last time. That is evolution. No one is designing these viruses. No one is making it happen. It is evolution, and it's the same kind of evolution that happens in every other organism. It's just got more population factors to it, and it happens a lot quicker. Viruses evolve faster than most people can understand, so most people don't realize that what is happening with viruses is, in fact, the same kind of evolution that selects populations of you and I as well. So evolution is the topic we're gonna look at the four main drivers of it today in some detail. First, making a lot of progeny. This is viral evolution. Making lots and lots of progeny, which you've already had a sense of, I think, already. Making a lot of mutants as well. And then we'll talk about something called the quasi-species effects. And finally, we have all this diversity in viral populations. We're gonna talk about how we select from it the new phenotypes that we see. So we know that virus-infected cells make lots of progeny. There are, there are countless 
numbers of virus particles in the oceans, 10 to the 30th, as we said on day one. Uh, here are just two examples of human viruses, hepatitis B virus and HIV, with uh, relatively uh, short half-lives, so the viruses turn over rapidly, 50% and 90% for these two viruses. And on a daily basis, a daily basis, 10 to the 11th hep B particles in the blood and 10 to the 9th HIV particles are made every day in an infected individual. All right, that is the difference between viruses and us, which take almost a year to reproduce. And in anyone's lifetime, we, anyone is lucky if they can make 10 or 12 uh, offspring. But viruses on a daily basis make billions and billions. And so these viruses interacting with our immune systems, our defenses, which we've talked about in this course, that is where selection and evolution occur at the simplest level. If you're taking an antiviral drug, within you is a resistant mutant that can eventually be selected and become the dominant member of the population. So large numbers of uh, progeny, a key feature of viral evolution. Now when you make a lot of particles, you're making lots of mutants because every replication cycle generates at least uh, some mutants, if not many. And in fact, evolution is made possible only through mutation. So the whole, the whole ability of every species, every kind of organism on the planet to evolve is so because mutation is the way that nucleic acids replicate. And these, as it shows here, DNA or RNA uh, on replication produce mutation, and that's, that gives rise to new possibilities. Viral genomes are always mutating. Please remember that when you go off into the world and do your thing after you leave here. They're always mutating. They're not mutating on, on any given minute or hour or day. They mutate at every replication cycle. And this is, may seem obvious to you, but for many people out there who write about science, it is not. So for example, the Ebola virus is mutating, say scientists. Scientists at a French research institute say Ebola has mutated. And I would say in turn, really, tell me when it's not mutating. It is mutating always. I think what they mean is that there's a phenotypic change, probably, but can you imagine that a science writer doesn't get the difference between genotype and phenotype? I'm not surprised, because it's been a long time since they've taken a science course, and they probably never took a virology course, which would crystallize for them what a mutation is. You will see dozens and dozens of headlines like this for the rest of your life, uh, and for some reason, they don't get it, no matter how much I rail against it and write. But again, remember, viruses are always mutating. Whether the mutation means anything, whether it results in a change in the properties of the virus, that's the real question. And in the, in the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, you know, they saw lots of mutation because the virus was infecting more people than it had ever before. It was over 20,000 infections. And it had never been that extensive before. So yes, of course you were seeing more mutation. But whether it meant anything is the question. And we don't really know to this day. Because why it's very hard to do an experiment in people, especially with the Ebola virus, and ask if a given mutation has any property. And we may talk about that uh, next time in, to a certain extent. Now last time we talked about the mutation rates of RNA and DNA viruses. Let me repeat the two again. These are very important concepts. All nucleic acid polymerases are error prone. Uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerases have no proofreading activity, so they have a higher of frequencies and one misincorporation per thousand or 10,000 nucleotides polymerase. So a, uh, a genome of 10 KB would have uh, about one mutation per genome if it's one in 10 to the fourth. So every time the genome replicates, it's one mutation in a collection of 10,000 genomes, you would have the whole genome mutated at every position, if it were random, of course. So that's RNA viruses. DNA viruses are not as error prone because they have proofreading. They make less diversity and they evolve slower than RNA viruses. But there's one more thing besides error frequency of the genome that's important to think about here. And that's cap encapsulated uh, in this image. This is a graph of genome size and nucleotides from 100 
to 10 to the seventh versus the mutation rate. And the mutation rate is expressed as substitutions per nucleotide per generation. And what we have here are a variety of viruses of different sorts and bacteria. And one of the key observations here is that as genome size gets bigger, the mutation rate goes down. You start up here on the upper left, this is a viroid. This is, this is the smaller, smallest self-replicating nucleic acid that we know of. We're gonna talk about these next week. They have the highest mutation rate. A viral genome can be about 100 bases long. As we start getting bigger, we move into the RNA viruses. We have plus uh, RNA and minus <laughs> RNA, the, the uh, yellow in the clear circles. We have retroviruses in here, right? So those are all of our uh, RNA viruses. They have pretty high mutation rates, especially if you compare them to bacteria. Uh, then we have double-stranded DNA viruses, the open circles with the blue outline. So they have lower mutation rates than RNA viruses, which I've been telling you. But then we have single-stranded DNA viruses right there. They have higher mutation rates than double-stranded DNA viruses. Exactly why, we're not sure. But if you think about how these forms evolved, we're gonna talk about this a bit later. We think the first molecules on Earth were viroids. And they had a really high mutation rate, but they could sustain it for reasons that we're not sure of entirely, but one of them is that they don't code for any protein. So you can have lots of mutations and it doesn't matter. From these early viroids arose RNA viruses with bigger genomes. And they were copied by polymerases and they didn't have any error correction, so they could only get so big. You know, the biggest RNA genome we know of is about 30 KB. The coronaviruses, they're, not, they're none bigger, probably because they, a bigger RNA genome can't sustain the mutation rate. So what happened? DNA evolved, but not just any DNA, because single-stranded DNA is very much like RNA in terms of its mutation rate. It's double-stranded DNA that made it possible to make even bigger, complicated genomes. And we talked in this course of, G of DNA viruses with genomes of over a million base pairs in length. So obviously, introducing error correction into that DNA polymerase allowed to, you to get even bigger genomes. And of course, to get cells, you had to have that as well. So a cell could never have an RNA polymerase uh, because it wouldn't be able to get big enough and complicated enough. So here we have, you can compare the mutation rates of DNA and RNA viruses in it. Confirms what I've already told you, but the other takeaway here is how to get bigger organisms needed to be, have double-stranded DNA. And we'll get back to this evolution business in a moment. Now, the, the, uh, one of the other things I wanna talk about today that's very important for understanding how viruses evolve is the quasi-species concept. You know, the original definition of a species is that uh, two organisms two organisms are different species uh, if they mate and the offspring are not viable, right? So, you know, a horse and a donkey are two species. When they mate, they make mules, but the mules can't propagate. So that's, that means the two are, but you can't do that with viruses very easily, right? So uh, that's why we call them quasi-species, because people name viruses this species and that species, but it doesn't follow the, the classical definition. Now this idea of a quasi-species concept came about in uh, 1978. This paper published in Cell, Nucleotide Sequence Heterogeneity of an RNA Phage Population. And what they wrote, they studied an RNA bacteriophage a, a, called Q-beta. Q-beta phage population is in a dynamic equilibrium with viral mutants arising at a high rate and being strongly selected on the other. The genome cannot be described as a defined unique structure, but rather as a weighted average of a large number of different sequences. So this was shocking to everyone. Everyone thought, this is a virus and here's the sequence. You can write it out on a piece of paper and that's this virus. And most people, including myself, didn't really get this for many, many years. But the point is that populations of viruses are equilibriums of non-identical but related replicons, and that's what we call a quasi-species. It's not one sequence, but it's a mixture of sequences, as we'll elaborate right here. So on the right is the sequence of poliovirus that I figured out in 1981 as a postdoc, which took me a year of my life to do, and it's 7,440 bases. 
and it's one sequence. And I said, aha, uh -huh, this is the sequence of poliovirus. Guess what? It's not, because poliovirus looks like that on the left. Each of those lines is a poliovirus genome, and this is how they differ. They're all different, pretty much. Um, just ex how, how different they are depends on how big the population is. You probably don't have every possible genome sequence, obviously, because that wouldn't be a poliovirus anymore. But it's safe to say that the RNAs, if I gave you a tube of poliovirus and you could sequence each RNA, most of them would be different. They certainly would not be the sequence on the right. The only reason I was able to get that sequence is because I determined the average for the population. The average sequence, or the consensus, there's probably no virus in a tube of polio that looks like that but rather it looks a little bit like that with changes throughout it. All right, so that's what a quasi-species is. Think about it as a tube of any virus given to you is not one sequence. It's many, many sequences. If there are a million plaque-forming units in that tube, there are probably a million different sequences in the tube as well. All right, that's the quasi-species. So why is that important? Why do you care? That's, it's important because if you take a virus and infect a cell or an organism, you're not infecting with a single virus particle. You're infecting with a population. And so that population, when it gets into the cell, all the different sequences are subject to the selection of whatever is in the cell. The, the defensive proteins in the cell, the cellular proteins that the genome requires to be translated and replicated and so forth, all of those are gonna have different effects on the different sequences. And so what comes out of the cell is gonna be a product of that selection. It will change slightly after every cell that's infected. And when the virus goes from host to host, it's gonna undergo another round of selection. So if, you're, if I'm sneezing and expelling viruses in the droplets that I'm expelling. Uh, they're full of vi viruses of many different sequences, but not every one of them is going to survive entry into the next host. Maybe some of those sequences make the virus uh, very susceptible to drying. So selection is going to occur both within the cell and uh, on transferal to new hosts. So the consensus is a myth. That sequence I published back in 1981, which I spent a year on, is probably a myth tough to deal with, right? It took me many years, not just to deal with it, to understand it. I didn't get it for many years, but this is a myth. The sequences of an RNA virus certainly cluster around an average, which is the average that I figured out. So I'm, I'm sequencing the average of the population, but every genome in that tube that I would sequence is different. I can't see the small variants. They don't show up in my assay because my assay, my sequencing method wasn't sensitive enough. Today, though, we have very high throughput deep sequencing methods. All right, so I took poliovirus and I ran enough sequencing reactions to get what we call 2x coverage. Basically, I could sequence each strand once. Today, you could do hundreds and hundreds of fold coverage of each strand. So you could tell, a very, you can detect very, very small changes in the genome. What we're running up against, though, is the error rate of the sequencing. Right now, we can tell very small differences in the genomes, but we're not sure if it's error or if it's actually biological difference, and people are trying to sort that out right now. Because the goal would be to take a tube of a million viruses and say, here's the sequence of each of those million genomes. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting there. And that would allow us to precisely describe the population. Mutation it makes up a quasi-species, but also two other factors we have to consider as well. I don't want you to forget these. Uh, recombination, which we talked about when we talked about RNA. Uh, when a molecule is being copied by a polymerase, this is an RNA molecule in blue, there's a shiny polymerase copying it. Uh, sometimes it switches templates. So here we're actually copying the green template because we're copying in a three to five prime direction. And then at some point the polymerase is starting to copy the other template. So the product is a recombinant of the two molecules. Certainly this contributes to the quasi-species as well. It's not just mutation, it's recombination. And for viruses that it can undergo reassortment, it's reassortment as well, like influenza viruses and real viruses. The segmented genomes can be uh, swapped amongst the different virus particles that co-infect the cell. So mutation, recombination, and reassortment all contribute to 
uh, the quasi-species. All right, so then let's talk about the selection on this population. You have a huge population of viruses that infects a host. It's not just one sequence, but many, many different sequences. Uh, let's say you're infected with HIV. You have a quasi-species of HIV in you, and you start taking antiviral drugs. Among all of those different viral genomes in you, maybe there is one that's resistant to the drug that you're taking. So the drug will inhibit the other viruses, but that one will amplify. It will start as a single particle, and it will multiply over and over. And because viruses multiply so quickly and, and make so many offspring, within a very short period of time, you will be full of drug-resistant viruses. And so that's what I mean by survival of the fittest. I use drug resistance because it's easy to understand, but it can be any kind of selective pressure, low pH, high temperature, you know, drying uh, upon transmission, anything like that. A rare genome with a particular mutation may survive a selection event, and it'll be found in all the progeny genomes. So that drug resistance mutation will be found in all the genomes that replicate in you as long as you live. But we also have what we call survival of the survivals. There are lots of other changes in those genomes that are gonna go along with the drug-resistant mutation. They don't really matter for drug resistance, but they're there, and so you will maintain the quasi-species. You'll have lots of variation at each position as long as that single mutation that confers drug resistance is there as well. So we say the linked but unselected mutations get a free ride. So you end up having, after selection, in this case it's drug that's selecting for uh, the virus, you have a new diverse population and the only thing in common are the selected mutations. Pro probably randomly, some of the other mutations may be in common as well, but they're not gonna be selected for, only the ones that we are putting pressure on, in this case, drug resistance. Let's talk a little bit about uh, this diversity. Diversity is actually in itself selected for, all right? So diversity gives you the, uh, mutation gives you the diversity you need to survive selective pressures, but the ability to make mutations in itself is selected for. We have identified mutations in viral polymerase that reduce the frequency of misincorporations. That makes the polymerases more faithful, less mutagenic. So here is one uh, in poliovirus RNA polymerase. You remember, RNA polymerases have an active site in the palm domain. And here are two changes at GLI64 in green, uh, in the palm domain and one in the fingers domain at HIST273, these single amino acid changes reduce the misincorporation frequency of the RNA polymerase of poliovirus. But if you take uh, one of these viruses that has a reduced mutation frequency, and let's say you co-infect a cell with a wild-type virus, who do you think is going to win? The wild-type virus that makes more mutations. If you put these two viruses into an animal model, who do you think is more pathogenic? Which one do you think will end up over-replicating the other? It's the wild type that makes mistakes. Kind of counterintuitive, but making mistakes is good. Not great on exams, I guess. It's not selected for, but in viruses, diversity is selected for. So the, the level of errors that we have in all the life forms on Earth, or the organisms, have been selected for over millions and millions of years to be exactly that way. So high mutations rate are selected. Mutation is good for viral populations. Now you may say, well, that has to do with viruses. What about other things? Well, people have made E. coli polymerases with, better, with lower mutation rates as well, and they're not very fit either. So this extends to many other organisms as well. Diversity is selected for. I've spent a lot of time talking about mutation rates and diversity, but you can have too much of a good thing. If diversity is a good thing, you can have too much of it. And that threshold, that if you exceed it, you, you're no longer in a good place, is called the error threshold. Okay, mutation has to balance survive genetic fidelity uh, otherwise, the organism won't live. So it limits the error threshold. You go over the error threshold, and that is basically as high as you can go in terms of the error rate for, for mutation. If you go over the error threshold, you lose infectivity. If you go below it, as we just showed, if you have a polymerase with a lower error rate, 
you don't survive. You can't make enough mutations to be competitive or to survive uh, selection. So that's error threshold. RNA viruses exist very close. They're living on the edge, right at the edge of the error threshold. And DNA viruses are more conservative. They, they are far below the threshold, right? So it's like liberals versus conservatives of the viral world, now the RNA viruses and the DNA viruses. Let's take a look at some experimental evidence for this. So we'll look at uh, a DNA virus, and we take a cell culture infected with this virus, and we incubate it, the, the infected cells with a base analog, and we'll use 5 azacytidine. And this is a modification of C, which uh, is incorporated as C, so the polymerase will put it in uh, whenever it sees uh, a G, but when it's copied, it looks like a T to the polymerase. And so it puts in, instead of a G, it puts in a T, and you introduce mutations. So this is a mutagen, basically. It causes G to A transitions. And this DNA virus, when you do this, the mutation rate increases several orders of magnitude, 1,000, 100 to 1,000 fold. In other words, when you treat infected cultures with this chemical, you get 100 to 1,000 times more viral mutants. So that's telling us that the virus is existing way below its error threshold. If you do a similar experiment with an RNA virus with a similar mutagen, um, the error frequency only goes up two or three fold, not two or three logs, just two or three fold. You can't introduce any more mutations into the genome. The viruses are non-infectious and you can't score them. So this is some of the evidence that DNA viruses exist way below the error threshold and RNA viruses are close to it. Here's another example with an RNA virus which uh, illustrates uh, another point that, uh, that I wanna make. This is an experiment where we're treating poliovirus infected cells with ribavirin, which is a similar chemical. It's a modified base that introduces mutations into the genome. And here, we're looking at uh, infectivity. So wild type is, a, is about 100% infectivity. And, and then we're looking at the infectivity as we increase the dose of ribavirin. So on the x-axis, we're increasing the dose of ribavirin. And we take the viruses that come out of each Point, and we can sequence the genome and see how many mutations we've actually introduced uh, by ribavirin. What you see is really remarkable, that only in introducing just a couple of mutations, the, the, the infectivity goes from 100% down to about 30%, okay? And then you put six or seven in, you're almost zero. So you can see that these viruses, again, are right at the error threshold. You introduce just a couple of mutations into the genome, and it makes them non-infectious. So the idea, they must have lots of mutations in them already uh, that are bringing them right to the edge of infectivity, but apparently that's selected for. It's good for them to do this, because if you reduce the mutation rate, these viruses don't do well. So many people, this is the case for many RNA viruses, including HIV, and people are wondering if we can use an antiviral like this, which is a mutagen, to push the virus over the error threshold. So you basically, in, instead of inhibiting a specific process with a drug like we talked about last time, you mutate the virus to death, and that may be an antiviral in itself. All right, so that is uh, error threshold. I want to tell you uh, another phenomenon in viral genetics that also illustrates the quasi-species concept, this whole idea that you need diversity in order to be a fit virus. And, and this is the concept of genetic bottlenecks. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a lot of selective pressure on a small population and we're gonna lose uh, fitness. So the experiment is we, we do a plaque assay with an RNA virus and we pick a single plaque and we resuspend the viruses in that plaque, a few thousand viruses, and then we plaque them out again. And then we take another plaque and we keep doing this on and on and on and on. We go plaque to plaque passage and you, go, you do this over and over again. And what you find is that after about 20 to 30 cycles of this kind of amplification, your virus barely grows anymore. I had a student years ago who was trying to adapt a virus to a different cell, 
And she did this experiment thinking it would be a good way to select for a variant adapted to the cell. And after 20 passages, she had no virus. And she said, what's going on? And I said, look at the lecture on evolution. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. What happens is uh, these viruses are, are less fit. So what's going on? The environment's constant. You're just doing plaque to plaque passage. So the cells are the same, the medium is the same, your room is the same, you know, everything is really the same. All you're asking it is for it to go from one plaque to another. So what is going on? Well, you're submitting these viruses to a bottleneck. You restrict re replication to all the viruses found in a one plaque, which is only a few thousand viruses. So if you think about a, the parent is uh, full of different uh, viruses. Uh, and only a few of them can squeeze through the bottleneck into your cells, and the surviving in individuals uh, have uh, much less diversity than the parental population. And so I told um, my student, uh, what's going on in your experiment is Muller's ratchet, which is an old genetic observation that small asexual populations, which, which viruses are, of course, decline in fitness if the mutation rate is high. And we know RNA viruses have high mutation rates. We know we're dealing with a small population here because we're going plaque to plaque and, and involving only a few thousand uh, virus particles. Um, and we know these viruses are close to the error threshold. And what we're doing is we are restricting population growth. There's not really selection, but we're simply uh, only allowing a few thousand viruses to grow and we don't have enough sequence diversity to allow this virus to grow eventually from plaque to plaque. So you're restricting the diversity of the population by passing so few viruses. And that should tell you that clearly you need sequence diversity to man maintain fitness. So who knows what's going on in, in the cell? Something must be slightly different each time that requires some sequence diversity in order to overcome. So why is it called Muller's ratchet? So it's, the metaphor is each new mutation works like a ratchet. So you know a ratchet is a gear with this, this little restrictor on it. It can only turn back and not forward. We're only in one direction. So the mutations move the gear in one way, but they can't move it back. Um, and you're having clicking relentlessly as mutations accumulate. I love that metaphor uh, for this whole procedure, the ratchet. And so here's what happened in terms of the quasi-species picture. So on the left is our initial virus population, quasi-species with lots and lots of different genome sequences that are all, they all have variations at many positions. When you do a high multiplicity passage, uh, you have this whole population to draw from. So if there's any odd selection going on in the infected cells, there will be a mutation in the population that can overcome it. So even though it looks like the conditions are exactly the same to us. They're not. They're slightly different from day to day, from cell to cell, requiring different mutations to overcome them. You know, who knows? Maybe the cells were a little less confluent one day than another. There were slightly different proteins produced, and that imposed the selection on the virus. But if you have your very diverse population of viruses, you can overcome that. Those are large population passages. Now, what we did in our placking experiment we pick one of these genomes, right? Or probably more than one, because even in a plaque, the few thousand viruses, they do have a little diversity. But just for illustration, let's say we pick one of these and we keep passing it. Eventually, uh, they're all going to have many uh, mutations in common. And the overall diversity is going to be very low. If you look at the column on the right versus the column on the left, you can see this one on the left has much more diversity. And so this population of viruses is unable to respond to whatever selective forces are occurring in this relatively simple experiment of a plaque-to-plaque -plaque passage. And that's why the fitness uh, decreases. So this is another way of saying that you need to have sequence diversity in order for virus populations to be successful. Here's an example, a real-world example of this experiment. This is fitness decline after passage through a bottleneck. So here we have a bacteriophage, 40 bottleneck passages, plaque to plaque, 22% decrease in fitness. VSV, uh, 20 passages, 18%. Foot and mouth, 30 and 60. HIV, big decrease here after only 15 passages. And another bacteriophage as well. So this is a universal phenomenon. You notice 
Uh, these are all RNA viruses. The same would happen with DNA viruses, but since they're way below the error threshold already, you could, you'd probably have to passage a lot more to get the same effect. So are, are you thinking, what does this have to do with the real world? Do you ever encounter a bottleneck in the real world? And I would say, yes. Let's think about how viruses are transmitted in nature. So aerosol transmission, when I'm coughing and sneezing and the little droplets are being expelled, they don't have very much virus in them. And that's going to infect a new host. And that host is going to sneeze and pass it to another and another. It's kind of like a bottleneck. You're restricting it to very, very small passages. Uh, activation of a latent virus. Remember herpes simplex virus from a couple of neurons in your uh, ganglia, your trigeminal ganglia, a couple of neurons, same idea. And it's going to pass to another person uh, and you get the same thing. Small volume of inoculum introduced by insect bites. Not a lot of virus there. Again, person to person passage. So there is in fact in nature bottleneck uh, in, in virus infections going on all the time. So why do viruses survive at all? Why don't they get restricted by Muller's ratchet? We think it is because um, you can restore uh, the proper genome by a number of processes. And the, the clue comes from an experiment where to avoid the ratchet, instead of doing plaque to plaque, if you pick a few plaques and pass a few plaques instead of simply one, you'll avoid the ratchet. So pool several plaques. You get more diversity in the population, and that allows you to construct a mutation-free genome. And so you can, use, you can imagine recombination or reassortment would allow you to do that. And we think that's what happens uh, in nature, that we, as long as you have enough sequence diversity to be able to construct a wild-type genome, uh, you won't adversely affect fitness. So let's see how that works. We have two, two viruses with mutations shown by these purple uh, lightning bolts in different parts of the genome. Uh, these have arisen during bottleneck passages and they're sick viruses, so maybe from respiratory transmission from one person to another. But we know that these viruses can undergo recombination and so what we think happens is uh, recombination between these two parental sick viruses will get rid of the mutations. Now we have a healthy viral recombinant. It simply eliminated uh, those two areas of mutation. Now, of course, you get all kinds of recombinants, but the ones with the right mutations or the correction, if you will, are the ones that are going to be selected for and survive. And you can do these experiments in the laboratory and show that re recombination is important. Reassortment also is important for viruses with segmented genomes for overcoming Muller's uh, ratchet. So this is the message of these series of experiments with respect to the ratchet. You need diversity for survival, all right? You have to have enough diversity so that whatever the virus encounters in a new cell, and it's going to encounter something slightly different, it has the population diversity in order that it needs to survive. People have been able to do similar experiments now by mutagenizing genomes. You can start with a single piece of RNA with a defined sequence, and you can mutagenize it in various ways, and you can confirm these kinds of uh, observations. All right, we've talked a lot about uh, sequence diversity and its consequences, but let's look at some uh, examples of how selection works on a diverse population. And I want to talk about two of them in specific, genetic shift and genetic drift. We've mentioned these before, but let's go into them in a little more detail. So overall, what we're talking about is the selection of viral mutants in response to an immune response of the host. So that can be antibodies or cytotoxic T cells. Remember, uh, viruses can evade antibodies in a number of ways by making lots of serotypes or by mutation. And viruses can also avoid cytotoxic T cells by sustaining mutations in the epitopes that are recognized by the CTLs. So in a person with a good immune response, you have great response against the virus, and you're always going to be selecting for mutants that can avoid the antibody or cellular response. And drift is diversity arising from mutation caused by uh, errors in the polymerase. So you can imagine if, you have, if you're full of an antibody to a virus, 
All you need is one amino acid change in the critical epitope and a virus will grow up that no longer is recognized by that antibody and that will dominate. And that's what we mean by drift. And that happens every year with the flu vaccine. The virus changes slightly and evades the antibody response. Shift is more dramatic. Shift is what happens after we see recombination or reassortment and we get a very different virus which still evades the immune response. So let's look at both of these uh, a little bit to understand them. And we bring, so this brings us back to influenza viruses where we're gonna illustrate both of these principles. And in specifically, influenza A viruses. Of the two, influenza A, B, and C, we worry about influenza A and B mostly. If you remember, these are classified by the serology of the HA and the NA, the glycoproteins that are in the membrane of the virus particle. And we call influenza viruses HXNY, H1N1, H3N2, et cetera. We've identified 18 different hemagglutinins out there in the wild and 11 different neuraminidases. And these can reassort in different combinations. Uh, one through 17 can infect birds. Number 18 was found in a bat. It's not clear that that can infect birds. And among humans, H1, H2, and H3 only can infect and transmit between humans. Uh, now, we're, we're beginning to see other H's starting to transmit somewhat, but not to the extent of H1, H2, and H3. All right, we needed that as a background for what I'm going to tell you now. Um, in, in the past hundred years or so, there have been a series of antigenic shifts with influenza virus that have led to pandemics. A pandemic is a global epidemic where many, many people are infected as opposed to an epidemic locally restricted. And the first one uh, in modern times, 1918, H1N1, uh, this virus ended up spreading globally, killing hundreds of millions of people, quite a lethal uh, virus. And as far as we can tell, uh, this was a duck virus that somehow acquired the ability to infect people. And since it's so long ago, before we had any viruses, virus isolates, it's very hard to reconstruct exactly what went on. That virus has circulated in people for many years until, in fact, 1957, when it was replaced by a new influenza virus, H2N2, which again caused a global pandemic of influenza. And this virus was a reassortant of the original uh, H1N1 and another duck virus, H2N2. So here is the duck virus here with its yellow segments. So you can see this 57 uh, isolate obtained one, two, three uh, RNA segments from this duck virus and had the others from the original H1N1. So in particular, the HA and the NA genes are what makes this an H2N2. They came from the duck. Uh, and the H1N1 genes of the 1918 are gone. Shift forward to 1968, another pandemic virus emerges, H3N2. And again, it's a reassortant. It has some uh, red genes from the original H1N1. Now it has a couple of genes, including the HA, from a duck virus, shown in blue here. And it has the NA gene still from the 1957 isolate. So you can see this is what I mean by antigenic shift. You have reassortment leading to completely new viral proteins like the HA and the NA, which of, to which, of course, nobody has any immunity. And that's why we have global epidemics, pandemics, because no one is immune, as opposed to uh, antigenic drift, where you have local epidemics depending on who's immune to what. And, and your antibodies do cross-react to a certain extent. They just can't prevent infection. Now, we, in 2009, we had another uh, outbreak of a pandemic virus, 2009 H1N1. We go back to the H1N1, and this was a complex reassortment of viruses from different origins. So it, you can see all the genes, the, the eight RNA segments are colored one, two, three, four different colors, because those are the parental viruses. They include an influenza virus of Eurasian swine, shown in this color, cyan. Uh, and then the other segments started off with a number of viruses from uh, classic swine, H1N1. These actually have been in pigs since 1918. They've been circulating since then, uh, and they contributed uh, some of these segments. Human H3N2, the red segment there, uh, an avian influenza virus. And there were some intermediate reassortants. 
which we're identifying. We can do this now because we have lots and lots of isolates. We can sequence all the genes and know exactly. I don't mean to say genes. You can sequence all the RNA segments and know exactly where they came from. And so you can see this is a product of multiple reassorted uh, events. Now, where does this happen? It's a good question. Influenza viruses have a huge reservoir in nature of birds and uh, many other animals as well. And so there we think the reassorted is occurring. And you know, if you have the right one that can infect people in it, and that animal that has it has contact with people, then you can initiate a pandemic. We think pigs are an important part of the equation because they often get infected with avian viruses, and we think a lot of the reassortment uh, may occur in them as well. So that's an example of uh, antigenic shift. We have discussed drift before, but let me remind you what it is. Uh, there on the left is the influenza virus particle, uh, and the hemagglutinin is in blue. The hemagglutinin is, is expanded on the right here, and uh, it is, of course, embedded in the viral membrane down at the bottom, but at the top is the sialic acid binding site. That's the receptor for the virus. And antibodies that we make against the HA induced by infection or vaccination typically bind to the top of this molecule. Those are the areas colored in blue and orange and uh, magenta. It only takes one amino acid change in these epitopes for the virus to be able to evade neutralization by the antibody. So antigenic drift is random mutations, again, in a quasi-species caused by error-prone nucleic acid synthesis, random mutations that give a, a mutant HA, which happens to have the amino acid change, that escapes the antibodies. If that starts in one person, it will then dominate that person, spread to others, and so forth. And eventually, by the next season, we have to change the vaccine. And so that's antigenic shift. It's basically mutation followed by selection. Now, another really interesting aspect of evolution is something that we, we kind of knew about but only recently have been able to figure out because we can sequence genomes of viruses and their hosts. And this is called the host virus arms race. The idea here is viruses in green, some host protein that is antiviral uh, in uh, yellow here. Uh, and it can neutralize virus infectivity. Either it could be an antibody, it could be some other antiviral protein. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if the, here at the top we start with the host winning, but the virus can undergo mutation. You can have a mutant arise by selection that has an amino acid change that evades the host protein. The virus will now multiply. The host then has to respond back to change and neutralize the virus mutation. And this goes back and forth, back and forth. And that is why uh, on the um, title page of this lecture, I have a quote from Lewis Carroll, around here, it takes all the running you can do just to stay in the same place. This whole process of events here is called the Red Queen hypothesis because uh, that was what the Red Queen said in Alice in Wonderland. And what she was referring to was the virus host arms race. She didn't know about viruses back then, but that's what is happening. In order for both virus and hosts to exist, both have to change back and forth. And we're beginning to realize this why we call it a host virus uh, arms race, and it's actually called the Red Queen uh, hypothesis. So here's an example of how we can look at this. You take a, a primate phylogeny. We have a whole host of our ancestors of, of different species of primates. We arrange them in a tree based on their, their sequences. Uh, and we can look at genes. Let's say we have a gene that we think is involved in antiviral activity. We can look at the sequence of that particular gene among all the different primates that are arranged according to this tree. And we can find bases that have uh, synonymous changes. In other words, the base change doesn't cause a change in the amino acid. We call those synonymous changes. They're in green here. The red ones are non-synonymous changes. Those are changes that lead to amino acid changes. Those are the ones we're interested in. Okay, now there, there are computer programs that will take all these sequences and tell you where the non-synonymous changes are. Uh, and then you can identify ones that are positively selected for throughout the tree in your lineage. So if they just occur randomly and disappear, that's not interesting. But if they occur and they are maintained, they are positively selected for, that suggests 
that if this is an antiviral protein, you know, this particular uh, mutation, amino acid change might be important. But even better, you can go on and test it to see if in fact what's happening is what you think it is. So we can determine the phenotypic consequences. We can take uh, the virus and the host protein in some uh, in vitro situation, some cell, and we can make the changes uh, in the virus, we can make the changes in the host, and we can see who wins. We can see who replicates and who doesn't replicate. So we can assign specific changes to the virus being able to replicate and the host being able to compensate uh, for that replication as well. And so, for example, we have here a particular amino acid uh, change. It's, it's S in some of the uh, species. Remember, this is a primate protein, and it's G in some others. We correlate virus winning with a C, with an S at the position, a serine, and a glycine when the host is winning. And you can take uh, the virus and the host and change this residue in the host and show that that's exactly what happened. So we can confirm the arms race essentially by looking at phylogenies and introducing mutations into the virus into the host protein. And I want to show you two examples of how these conflicts, we call these virus host conflicts, how they've driven evolution of the immune system. Um, on the right is PKR. Anybody remember PKR? <laughs> it's, a, it's the last, before the last exam, I know, but PKR is that RNA activated protein kinase. It's activated by double stranded RNA. It is a broadly antiviral protein. Remember, so many viruses encode antagonists uh, to this protein. And here are some of them. Herpes, flu, pox, hep C, different antagonists. And people have done this host virus mapping that I just told you with PKR and the antagonists from each of these viruses. And look, uh, many of the viruses target the RNA binding domain. The little red arrows are changes that have been selected for during evolution that antagonize a viral change. So some of them target the RNA binding domain, some of them target the kinase domain of the protein. And the fact that these changes are all over PKR tells us that this is uh, a protein involved in antagonism by many viruses at many different places. In contrast, here is a protein called Trim5-alpha, which is involved in antagonizing HIV-1, specifically by binding to the capsid. So much more restricted and a very specific mechanism. And if you map the arms race between Trim5-alpha and HIV capsid, those are the red arrows right there. You can see they're restricted to a very small part of Trim5-alpha. So you can do this with known antiviral proteins and viruses. Sometimes you can go back and take a virus, a series of isolates, and look at a particular protein that's changing and actually learn that it's an antiviral protein. Now, despite this, we have a lot of diversity. We do have some restrictions which we don't understand. And I, did, I do think I mentioned this before. There are only three serotypes of polio, but lots of rhino. There's one measles. There's continuous influenza variation. Why is this? Don't know the answer. It must have to do with the architecture of the virus and its ability to uh, accommodate changes, but no one has really been able to figure out why these viruses are so different. And you know, polio, despite having only three serotypes, measles, despite having only one serotype, if it weren't for the vaccines, uh, they would still be around and, and causing lots of infections. All right, now the, the next thing I want to talk about is virulence, the evolution of virulence. Is virulence positively selected? Do viruses become more virulent or do they become less virulent as they circulate in their hosts? And, and some people think that it's, there's a negative selection on virulence because increased virulence uh, kills the host quicker and it's hard for the virus to transmit if you're killing the host in a couple of days, right? The host can't walk around if it's immobilized and so forth. Other people think virulence is possibly selective for because I don't know, if you cough more after an infection, you're going to be able to transmit it more to other hosts. So if virulence is negatively selected for, then you would expect uh, all viruses to be maximally infectious and avirulent. But of course, that's not what we see. Many viruses are still virulent in us. And, and you have to distinguish between viruses that have recently entered us and viruses that have been around us for a long time. Because HIV, which only came into us in 1920, probably has not had enough time to evolve and for us to watch it evolve. And all the other viruses that have been in us for a long time, 
measles, polio, et cetera, herpes viruses, it's too old because we don't have the original isolate, so we can't really go back and look at it. So it's a tough problem. But there is some experimental data that I want to tell you about that bears on this issue of evolution of virulence. And this was an experiment done in Australia. Back in 1859, uh, they imported the European rabbit to hunt them. They wanted to be able to hunt, so they said, let's import these rabbits and um, hunt them. But there were no predators of the European rabbit. It wasn't a natural animal of Australia. It reproduced to plague proportions. The country was overrun with rabbits, as you can see from this picture. So they couldn't get rid of them. So they decided uh, to release a virus to kill off these European rabbits. And they decided to release myxoma virus. The natural host is a cottontail rabbit. I think that's a cottontail there. But he's got a cottontail too, so I'm not sure. It's one of these two. <laughs> one of these is a cottontail, and one of them is a European rabbit. Uh, the natural host is a cottontail. The virus is spread by mosquitoes. And the uh, rabbits develop warts, and the mosquitoes spread it from rabbit to rabbit. But European rabbits are different, and in them, the infection is, is highly lethal. So that's why this virus was released in Australia. So in the first year, it killed 99.8% mortality rate. But by the second year, it was 30%. And this didn't work because the rate of killing was lower than the reproductive rate, and they weren't able to eradicate, so it failed. And so there are still lots of rabbits around Australia. But this illustrates a nice point that, first of all, rabbits and viruses make lots of offspring, right? The virus evolved to kill fewer rabbits. What, they, what we think is that it evolved so the lifespan uh, of the rabbit would be lengthened so it could survive the winter. And in the spring, new mosquitoes arising would take the virus from the rabbit and spread it from rabbit to rabbit. If you kill all the rabbits immediately, there's no way the virus is going to exist. So this is not an active thing, of course, but it is rather selection. Those viruses that were less, less lethal dominated the population, and they were able to spread more effectively. And of course, we also know that the rabbits evolved to become more resistant. They have an unusually high reproduction rate, and so this is something that we can see in this experiment. This is what you would predict. You put a brand new pathogen into a host, lethal, and then after time, uh, both evolve in order to maintain both in, in nature. And this is not the kind of experiment we can do with people. So what do we know about evolution in people? Well, these viruses, Lassa, Ebola, HIV, these are relatively recent animal to human crossovers. Uh, HIV crossed over in 1920, as we'll see in a bit, and um, it hasn't had time to evolve. It's still quite virulent in people. It hasn't had enough time probably to evolve because we are not rabbits. We don't reproduce as, as effectively as rabbits. We haven't evolved either. Um, Ebola virus doesn't, is not a human virus. Every time there's an outbreak, it's a brand new transmission from animals to people. So it's never gone from people to people to people, which is what you need to see the evolution of virulence. That's what we saw in the rabbit outbreak. Now, older jumps from animals to humans, polio, measles, that happened many thousands of years ago. These viruses are less virulent, but we don't have the early isolates of those viruses to be able to study them and compare and see what changes went on. So right now, we don't know anything about uh, what has happened in people. And as I've said before, the press is obsessed with increased virulence. And here are three quotes from the Times, the New Yorker, uh, and the Times saying that these viruses are mutating, will go airborne, Ebola is going to replicate and get better from person to person. Uh, here's Peter Hotez saying Zika mutated and then spread across the Pacific. You know, all of these are wrong in the end. And I hate to say it, but these are three scientists who are saying this, and the press picks it up and they love it, because you know it's all about an outbreak and wiping out the world. That's what sells newspapers, death and destruction. But it's not true. As far as we can tell, the viruses, there's no evidence that viruses become more virulent in people. We have no data, of course, to evaluate it. We never can. But so far, I haven't seen anything that suggests that they become more virulent. Once they're in people, they seem to be pretty good at spreading uh, already. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the origin of viruses. As you know, we have fossils for many animals that allow us to construct uh, evolution of those. 
but we don't have a lot of old virus stocks. The oldest ones we have are 1918 influenza and uh, the 30,000 year old virus from uh, the Siberian frost, permafrost. However, we do, we do have nucleotide sequences which we can compare and, and get an idea of how old viruses are. So for example, we use molecular clocks, the mutation rate of the polymerase to estimate the time scale of herpes genome revolution and we think they're about 180 to 220 million years ago uh, around the time of the dinosaurs. If you um, look at integrated sequences in host genomes, you can get even more information. Retroviruses integrate in an obligatory manner into the host genome, but pieces of other viruses also randomly, accidentally integrate as well. We call these endogenous viruses, retrovirus and otherwise. And here's how it works. You have an ancestral host that gave rise to three different species. Early on, this, this uh, phylogeny, uh, you had a split and leading to two different species here. Um, this species C did not receive the integration of the virus which happened after the split. So germline integration of this particular virus happened here. Uh, and then you can see both of these species A and B which arose after the infection. They both have the integrated virus and they have it in the same place in the chromosome, which tells you that those arose, that the integration arose before the species A, B split. Uh, so you can time the, when this integration occurs. If you have a good phylogenetic tree, you can uh, estimate the maximum and the minimum age of your endogenous viral element. And this has been done here for uh, single-stranded DNA virus integrations. Again, these are accidental integrations. They have nothing to do with the life cycle, but they give us a handle because they're right in the genome, in the germline, and we can track them uh, in phylogeny. So three different single-stranded DNA viruses. We can look in all these species. Here's a phylogenetic tree of all these species and how they're related from common ancestors. And we can look in their genomes. And this is, of course, driven by genome sequence of all these species. We can see exactly where the piece of DNA is integrated. We can estimate, based on the species and its relation to the other species, about how many uh, years ago it went in. So you can see the estimated integrations 30, 60, uh, and 90 million years ago. And the first day of class, I showed you this slide, how old are viruses. Uh, there are some recent estimates uh, based on integrated retroviruses in marine species that they went in over 450 million years ago. So that's how that information is obtained, by looking at the phylogeny in a way that I've just explained to you. And I, I left you with this statement. They likely originated billions of years ago before cells, and I promised to explain it to you. So let me explain it to you uh, now. So we have two theories on where viruses came from. First, that there was an RNA world of little molecules of RNA replicating in Earth, out, no cells, just pieces of RNA that were able to replicate the primordial RNA world. From that arose cells, possibly initially RNA cells and then DNA cells, and these uh, early viruses then be, uh, became able to infect these cells. The other idea is that viruses have escaped from cells, that cells were first, and that viruses took a bunch of genes with them, uh, and uh, that's their origin. The, the idea that viruses ar arose before cells, so the last universal cellular ancestor, that's some hypothetical ancestor of all cells on Earth, uh, the possibility that viruses arose before them, which would be the precellular origin, is supported by the discovery of protein structures uh, conserved among viruses with little sequence similarity. So the idea is if they arose from cells, you wouldn't have seen that. Of course, this is a very difficult theory to prove, and it, it's only based on sequencing different genomes. But what it leaves us with is the realization that uh, all known types of viruses most likely evolved long before humans appeared on Earth. We've only been here for a short time. Uh, and therefore, all human viruses have come from animal viruses. And that's the pattern we see today. Uh, for example, smallpox virus sequence analysis uh, indicates that uh, there are 45 isolates organizable into three clades. 
There's the uh, same number of genes in each isolate and lack of diversity suggesting a recent introduction into humans. And the idea is that uh, smallpox arose after a zoonotic infection from infected gerbils because the virus phylogeny that you construct suggests that pattern. So smallpox was the gerbil virus. Measles seems to have come from cows. It's highly related to rinderpest, which today still infects cows. And when we began to domesticate cattle, put them together in large numbers next to people, that's when we got their viruses. Uh, maybe about 5,000 years ago, it jumped from cows into people. Uh, and then from there spread around the world. So we think it arose in the Middle East and spread around the world as we, we migrated and colonized, reached the Americas in the 16th century and destroyed large numbers uh, of Native Americans there because they, they hadn't seen it before, they hadn't been growing cows, and therefore the virus was new to them. So let's assume that uh, new viruses can only arise from those that we have now on Earth. They're not going to arise de novo. What is the number of all possible mutations of the virus genome? And as I've been telling you, there are lots and lots of potential mutations. Uh, over half of all nucleotides in some genomes can accommodate mutations, at least experimentally. But if we assume that every base could be mutated in a virus, let's say take a 10 KB viral genome, there are four to the 5,000 potential different sequences that you could have. And that would be increased by deletions, recombination, and reassortment. So how big is that? It's really big because 4 to the 135 is the number of atoms in the visible universe. That's huge. But the number of potential mutations in viruses is even bigger. Nevertheless, uh, we don't see any brand new viruses emerging. You know, flu is always flu. Herpes is always herpes. We maintain master sequences. How do we maintain stability in the light of all this potential mutation? Well, there are constraints on viral evolution. You know, a DNA virus can't become an RNA virus. You have to retain signals for replication, interaction with host proteins, for the production of mRNA. You need to maintain RNA structures and codon usage. These are just some examples of the constraints, the physical nature of the capsid. You can't go from an icosahedral to a membrane-containing virus. Uh, and, of course, there's also selection during infection. If a mutant arises that's too lethal, it won't survive. Uh, or if it's not able to replicate enough, it won't survive either. So selection has weeded out uh, many of those mutations. So let me leave you with this thought. So as you know, we are 98 or 99 percent chimp as far as our genome sequence goes. If you line the two up, 99% of our sequences look just like that of chimp. It took 8 million years for those 2% or 1% differences to arise and be selected for in people. Now, when you're infected with poliovirus, it takes about five days to uh, go from uh, the infection out to the respiratory tract. You get far more genetic change in those five days than from chimps to humans. Can you imagine what a virus could do with 8 million years or even more?